So welcome again. Uh, tonight we are thrilled to offer two accomplished poets to you for uh, your evening's uh, edification. Uh, they flipped a coin and Maura Linehan will start and she will be followed by Bart Malio. Uh, so let me first introduce Maura to you. Uh, Maura, I believe is joining us from the Boston area. Is that right? Okay. That's right, that's okay. right. Wonderful. Uh, an accomplished poet, she's the author of four collections of poetry. Her, her work takes on the subject, the difficult subject of loss and offers meditations on two signature iconic landscapes um, in her life. The pond near her home in Massachusetts and the far reaches of Ireland. Uh, Moore's poems have appeared in numerous anthologies, including the Georgia Review, uh, Nimrod, Notre Dame Review, Poet Lore, Poetry East, The Prairie Schooner, among others. Uh, she's received several writers in residencies or has been at several writers in residencies, including two in Ireland, in County Kerry and Monaghan. Uh, tonight, she's going to be reading, I believe, from her two more recent uh, books. One is called And Company, which I happen to have the book here. And the other is Toward, uh, which has several of her works from her uh, time in, in or reflecting upon her time in Ireland. So uh, I'd like to ask us all, if you wouldn't mind, uh, giving a very warm Zoom welcome now to Maura Linehan. Well, it's my pleasure to be here um, in support of Bart's new book, Out on the Rim, of the now. Um, and I'm very honored to have been asked to join him. I thank Caneo Books, Catherine and Mary Ann um, for all the work that you've done for tonight. Um, so I'm going to begin with work from Tord. Um, a couple of poems are gonna bring you to Ireland and then I'll introduce you to Ant Company. Um, this takes place in the far, far Southwest of Ireland. Um, they say the next parish is in America. Um, and I've had the opportunity to be there twice, and um, I'm going to just read to you from two poems, Where There's a History of Famine. They're always eating the grass. One or two look up startled when I walk near. They go on chewing. Four o'clock one afternoon, I hear a herder whistle. His sheep come panting. What does he have that they want? Locals said it was coming. The hurricane off Bermuda turned this way. All week winds had moaned. Now screeching, they huddle round the cauldron of this cottage. Through the night, they howl. The surf's poundings drowned out. Next day, winds come off the cliffs. They swell the waves, march them toward the West Cork Hills. The waves spume white froth. Heavy black brimmed clouds follow after an endless parade. I climb toward land's end. Winds won't let me walk straight. The sky's clearing, I chance it. I've not yet walked down to the Abbey's ruins. Crows raise a ruckus, flush a feather thin pheasant with its hurrying tail of trail, trail of tail. Only the well fed could find meat on those bones. A famine's reach like this land, where the heavens lower their weight on dark clouds, the bay and rain blur, the horizon a vast front for thousands of miles of sea where those left built cairns at the backs of their mouths. And to give you a sense of the landscape where I stayed, it was called the Kilrillig Project. Um, Kilrillig, the name of the place where I was staying. Um, I created a, a rather long poem and I'm only going to read one section from it. Um, it's entering the Kilrillig landscape. 
And what I did in this poem is I'm focusing on sound. Um, and so I have this section, which is dedicated or devoted um, to the vowel sound of the long A. And so I ask you to listen for some of those sounds in entering the Kilrillig landscape where cliffs face a bay bathed in perpetual grave gray. Even on days with sun, rain clouds are always on the way. Always waves racing in fail to contain themselves. The weight of the North Atlantic presses them. Gales of wind push them to break against the base of the cliffs. But waves can't be destroyed, so they're raised to spray and raging foam. Way out on the wavering horizon, fog fades to mist. Mist pales to water-filled rays of light traces of the last storm's passage, the coming grace of sun. And though all the while, two men in a lone bobbing boat wait for fish in the midst of the bay. Sheep and cows graze along the tops of the cliffs. Wind breaks the ferns. And the poem continues through the rest of the vowels, but I'm going to turn now to my other book, which came out in 2022. This and Company. This is a biography of sorts of my mother's mother. She was a dressmaker in Paris at the end of the um, 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, and I know next to nothing about her. Um, and I don't have any documents, so largely this is an imagined biography. I know she was born in 1876 in the town of Angers, which is 165 miles west, southwest of Paris. I know she somehow at some point got into Paris where she worked as a dressmaker. I know she met my grandfather there. Um, and um, that's about it. I know they emigrated, the two of them, with my aunt, their first child born. Um, they left in 1905 for Boston where they set up shop. Um, so this is how they met. It's not, um, I made it up. I hope it's plausible. Cut from the same cloth. History proves she found a room of her own on Rue St. Anne, likely close to her shop where she's designing and sewing, fitting, fitting again dresses and skirts, jackets and capes. What's more, she's learned to update her own pieces add or remove braid, buttons, bows, replace cuffs and collars for the world of women entering her shop with their chaperones, mothers or aunts, sisters or cousins, maybe even a maid. So how do I get her introduced for no proper woman would ever do so herself to my grandfather? He who'd left Budapest for Paris to find work as a tailor, walking a good part of the way there. When I know him, always a walking stick in his hand, the initials for Jules ATN Washer on a silver band just below its head. Always in a three-piece suit, likely worsted wool, so much stronger, smoother, lighter than other wools. Woven loosely, it breathes. Hang it overnight, it sheds wrinkles. Dressmakers in Paris had turned to it when cotton could not be shipped during America's Civil War. We're still turning to it as one century was turning toward the next. So much more practical for women heading out to play tennis, take up archery, which is why I turn to that wool now, decide to have them meet in whatever arrondissement their distinguished merchant sold his cloth. Those two, there that day at the same time, his suit, her dress assuring this merchant with his commanding posture, tape measure around his neck, it would be fitting and proper to introduce them. Monsieur, puis je vous présente Mademoiselle Marie Rambeau. Marie Rambeau, my grandmother. Um, and I present you a poem now from late in the collection. My grandparents have emigrated from Paris. They're in Boston and they have set up a shop, Jules Washer and Company, and Company, the title for this book. Um, and this poem, it talks about the ampersand um, 
in the ant company. And you know their names, Marie, um, and it's Jules Washer will become the name of the company. Ampersand. Around even at the time of the famous eruption of Vesuvius, an ampersand on the wall that survived, scribes writing in cursive the custom of fusing letters, in this case E and T for and, using shortcuts even in those times to save time, save parchment, or maybe just to feel the flourish of those letters' tails wavering through and out their fingers. Such a feminine symbol, my friend Mary said. And right away, I see what a course it did to women's waists. Or for another variation on this theme, two letters bound like that termed a ligature. So for my grandmother, she too, bound in marriage, bound in business to Jules Washer, she the Ant Company in Jules Washer and Company. She put in writing as the never named, as in some luxurious ampersands, the E and T barely visible, if at all, barely distinct, if at all. Who was she? I know seamstress to this day, unable to close the distance between us. And I'm going to close with the one link that I do have to my grandmother. It's an Ars Poetica. For those of you who aren't poets or writers, an Ars Poetica talks about some kind of activity, and it never mentions poetry, but really the writer is explaining what it's like to make a poem. Ars Poetica. Nine-tenths preparation, this artist's work. First fabric between thumb and forefinger. Feeling weight, texture, give, nap. The planning beforehand. Washing washable textiles to shrink them before they're sewn. Laying out the pattern so the design flows. The plaid lines match, the dress drapes. Shears sharp so the seams won't pucker, twist, ravel. A seamstress's stress. Then the fitting, the pinning and repinning those seams. Right shade of thread, the sewing seemingly magic, not one stitch visible. Each seam, steam pressed flat, till at last the sewn carries material and a dressmaker's vision out into the world, all in one piece, seamlessly. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maura. Oh, thank you. Really, really lovely. Um, so, you know, Maura was being modest by saying she was the warm up act um, because your, your work is quite lovely and blessings on, on it. And may you continue to write uh, beautifully about your family and, and those around you. Um, so I've just dropped in the chat if anybody actually would like to get more or Bart's books directly from us, you can contact us uh, at the store either by giving us a call or, or sending us an email. But really the, 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 the driving force behind tonight's event is our dear friend Bart Malio, who is such a both a, a student of poetry and a poet. Every time Bart comes to the store, I learn something new about a particular poet. Um, he's just constantly searching for people who speak with passion. Uh, and quite poetically uh, about the human condition. So we're celebrating his publication, Out on the Rim of Now. Let me pull it back a little bit. And it, I'm not doing it justice because the cover is exquisitely beautiful and designed by the artist Janine Mannheim, who is Bart's companion and wife. So um, you get, it's a twofer there. Anyway, Bart's collection 
I, Bar, I see a lot of your people are joining right now, so I'm letting a lot of them into the into the room. Um, so for those of you who know Bart, you probably know that he is a jazz musician, and his his ability, his ear for music is, is totally threaded through the entire collection of of work in in this particular volume. He describes it as a kind of fragmentary memoir, which I think is a very astute observation. Um, as a former Trappist novice, his poems deal, you know, both with human nature, with love, and the spirit world, uh, the divine. Uh, he, he is also contemplative in his approach, and he says that the transcendent truths captured in jazz and the natural world reverberate, you know, through him onto the pages of the book that he has brought to life. Uh, Bart lives in, is it Smithtown? Am I right about that? Yeah. So he's joining us from there this evening. And I'd like to read a quote uh, about the book from Dylan Diamond, or Desmond, excuse me, who is a, 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 a musical artist, who says that Bart's poems share the present and meditative qualities of Proust, in addition to his unwavering love of tea. The poems are musical, humble, and vulnerable in a wide spectrum from fantastical and surreal to quiet and contemplative. So I know that Marianne would love to have made the introduction, but she is here with us listening, my partner who is also worked with Bart on the manuscript. So we both welcome Bart Malio to Canio's book stage. Welcome Bart. Thank you so much. I I got to say, like, uh, you know, reading with Moira is like, you know, being on, for me, it's like being on the same bill as like Sonny Rollins. If you haven't read all her stuff, she's a monster technician. And the stuff is just, it works as music. It works on all kinds of different levels. And it's, it's really, it's really nice to be reading with. And I, I do want to thank Catherine and Marianne who have who have supported this work. Marianne was like uh, was was uh, the editor for it to make sure it wasn't completely cockeyed. And so it's really nice to uh, to have their support again as I do this reading. This first poem is called "My Past." My past is a network of spies hidden behind the Iron Curtain from before the war. No one can tell them it is over, and although I have withheld their pay, they are patriots working only for the cause. In dreams, ciphered signals arrive. Before dawn, I fumble through code books. She observed in love, meet me, wear beret. They embarrass me, lurking near monuments, trench coated, clutching day old copies of Le Monde. And yet loyalties cannot be ignored. Hardships, past valors and a dim fidelity, bridging the then and now. This next poem is entitled Lament. No New Orleans funeral dirges, no pall bearing brass band melancholy. A single piano chord hangs in an upper room, a branch knocks the window, all the spiders spinning, a cough on the ground floor and then the closing of doors. So this next poem is entitled, O Antiphons. And for those of you that haven't sung the, the uh, Gregorian chant associated with the monastic office, there are seven antiphons that are sung along with the Magnificat during the prayers of Vespers on the last seven, day, seven days of Advent before Christmas. 
and all of them begin with the letter O. Ordo fratrum minorum keeps these orange flames lit, some electric, others touched alive by hand. Oxygen and prayer forge smoke out of orisons, bearing our oblations upward beyond opacities, anxieties. Oasis, origin, honor oaths struck with your people, bread, wine, oil, and water reform us, ordain us as bringers of your peace. So this, this next poem is the haiku poet as a gunslinger. And I'm reading it in the hopes that Paul and Nick, who are listening, get a chance to hear it. It's called Cleaning Up the Town. I would stand alone at the far end of a single dirt street and hitch back my serapi, drawing out the empty, long-barreled revolver, I would point west and ask, are these not unlike the mountains Basho saw crossing into Shirakawa three centuries ago? This next poem is entitled Test Pattern. All things have unity in simile, at least, with associations providing a timeless narrative of translation and approximation. Orange becomes baseball, becomes pinstripes, becomes business, until P.T. Barnum stands in wingtips and a black cravat, talking pitching with Yogi Berra, who, pushing back his mask, bites down on a thick rind of Floridian fruit, so his thick fingers can gain purchase and yank the husk off the thing, which comes away whole like the cover of a foul ball unlaced by shoeless Joe Jackson, sometime during that final triumphant season before the ignominy and defeat. Kahlo, perhaps, could grant this moment unity. The sun like orange, the gray pinstripes, the meaty fingers, the black, Stove by Pat. This next poem is called Middle Age, and this was written as a uh, birthday present to one of my very good and, and uh, long term friends, Sharon Gadneo. Are now all our revels ended? Some say youth lies in the choosing and our choices are mostly made. Some say youth lies in rebellion, but we have reached a troubled peace. Our days are heavy with blood and bread, flesh and loam. We have become our dreams and they have surprised us in their comings true. Now the hard work, the long tricky passages through the ice flows, alone in the wheelhouse, in the dead of winter's night, the crew turning in their bunks below. We are become the watchmen and Around us, a city slumbers, full of others' dreams, young and old, 
entrusted to us. We light our lamps and walk the battlements among them. No longer afraid, we gird ourselves. Unpaved, the road stretches into the distance towards empty peaks. Each of us will climb alone. This next poem was uh, written for my wife, Janine, after we went to see uh, a performance of Romeo and Juliet, and it's just simply entitled For Janine. We lean against each other at the play, too old to counterfeit a Montague, for Monday's ruins Wednesday may renew, and dark clouds scatter ere the close of day, nor could we countenance a Capulet, concealing truth behind a mask of death, unmoved while re weeping parents placed a wreath upon our vain and selfish monument. Our reason whispers sweetly to our passions, our friendship buoys, injuries, and slights, holding ourselves aloof from fads and fashions, long days apart converge in gentle nights. Uh, this next poem is entitled Exhortations for Artists, and it's for Schwanza and Henry David Thoreau. And I'm glad Kidder gets to hear this. Seek the shape of ancient mountain birch. With unrestrained gaze, reach out of thin earth into the fulminating heavens. With one half, dance unfettered in the storm. With the other, drink the mountain's root. Bend unbreaking branches beneath marches mix of snow and frozen rain, blossom in bunches of ivory florets, clusters of milky lace and filigree, whose chartreuse leaves imperceptibly deepen to mossy malachites. As moon illuminates the lichens, welcome the emperor, the sphinx, and the lime hawk upon your branches, blaze gold and burn a verdigreased bronze, each leaf unique and freely given, no contingency, your coming forth, unmistakably singular and molded by hands other than your own. With knots and knobs deflect the ax, persistence grain, in every twist and vein. Above all, be useless, fit companion to hawks, avens, boulders, foxes, switchgrass, tarns, and the ruminative bear. Burst forth in glimpses. So Mora mentioned early, uh, earlier the value of writing a poem that's an Ars Poetica. And this is, this is one of several I've written. This is for uh, a favorite jazz composer and trumpeter, the late Bill Dixon. And it's both about the solitude of the creative endeavor and uh, the way jazz has impacted me as an individual and as a writer. It's called Vector. Words trickle, each sound a shimmering drop, a moment of intention. A pivot point, alone, distinct, in space. A sound or sounds, swinging free in the air, until context, a meaning, then shooting off 
into the interlunar dark on course. A single trumpet note okay, so meant as it fades in a dark I inadvertently muted you, so I apologize. Oh, okay. I unmute someone else and the cursor slipped. Oh, no worries. Apologies. All right. Uh, you want me to read the, would anyone like to read the final <laughs> verse? Would you me to reread the final verse? All right. A single trumpet note bent as it fades in a, in a dark practice room, in a college conservatory, late, late at night. This next poem is entitled Wilderness of Mirrors. And uh, those who know me professionally know that I'm uh, formally trained as an intelligence analyst. And this is kind of a Catholic critique of the world of secrets. O oh, wilderness of mirrors, a breadless waste of self, no brackish streams flow east towards some greater river, only a mirage of others, a veiled threat, stony laughter, peripheral phantoms, the wind among the rocks. This graven image blasted baked, forgotten, until the self we worship is obscured from all memory. What will the wind say? Something knocks upon our doors, bone on wood, demanding payment, and we pretend that we are not at home. If only water or bread or wine or a traveler bound with us along this road, night is coming on soon. What will the wind say? And uh, the, the rest of you know, for the most part, that uh, I punch the clock as a computer network defender and uh, intrusion analyst at a research institution. And this, this next poem, uh, Cyber Defense, is a pretty typical day captured in sonnet form. An early Thursday, coffee hot and black, I sit beneath fluorescent lights and watch reconnaissance attempts, a blundered hack from rural France, when flaring like a match, some compromised computers wake and try to blast our websites off the net. They fail predictably, but time to coincide with this attack, a single piece of mail arrives, a program masquerading as a picture. Open it and your PC will relay all your data to Hamas. I forward this to spies outside DC, assemble logs, then type up my report and hope we face this hacker in a court. So here's another uh, birthday present poem. This is Lantern, uh, written for my old friend Sharon Pace on her 50th birthday. I have lost count of the hours spent past midnight on the steps of summer porches, of the lukewarm mugs of herbal tea balanced on amps in rehearsal studios, of the ecumenical salons and the kinship of dreams, of antiquarian bookshop hoards and deep fried 
Vietnamese spring rolls, of the ecstatic prayers catapulted toward heaven on the wings of a sound system, of small kindnesses and companionable silences. Your heart is a lantern lit in a farmhouse window, cheering the weary traveler leading his fog damp horse long after sunset across the rolling empty moorland. This next poem is entitled The Gregorian Custos. Now, in Gregorian chant, a custos is a note that appears at the end of a line. It is not meant to be sung. It's silent, but it alerts the singer to what the first sung note will be on the line that follows. And this is for my old friend, the uh, visual artist and avant-garde jazz musician, Steve Callahan. Silence begins sound, which blooms lily-like, milk erupting, into black coffee, after the churning, slowing, suspension, equilibrium. The long tones you hear sitting past sunset in a darkened room, like dust settling in tiny bookstores, in closet-sized offices, painted battleship gray, lit fluorescently tiled black and yellow, like the whir and click of changing traffic lights heard in passing long after midnight at summer's empty intersections. And I'm, I'm gonna close with this. This is entitled Statement of Work. Poetry is the parking lot of an office building in an unfashionable neighborhood of Orlando, Florida, where standing at the driver's side door of your rental car in summer twilight, you may gaze unfocused at the building's adobe roof, suddenly alive with the darting emerald green of tiny chameleons. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Bart. That was really- Thank you, Bart. Thanks, Bart. What a treat, Bart. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific, Bart. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say, Listening to both of you, your your work is different but impassioned, and it, there's sort of a harmony. And and maybe I'm thinking the musicality of it. Um, in listening to both of you, and and to borrow a word from yours, Bart, a, a, a companion. Uh, a, they're companionable, to be sure. Um, so. My first, we now have a little time for questions, and I'm going to start with one. Bart, can we fight cyber attacks with poetry? I think so. I think that uh, you know uh, one of the one of the things that uh, I've learned from years as a computer network defender is the good stuff never gets reported, and the bad stuff does. So for, for every crazed event, you know, on the, the, you know, the front cover of the Post or the Times, there's a, there's a five-year-old's birthday party that's life-changing. Wonderful. So if anyone has a question, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand because there's so many of us here on the Zoom and that'll be an easy way for uh, to be called upon.
And while people are reflecting on a question, I wonder, uh, you know, Maura, if you could talk about how you and Bart connected and give us a little bit of, um, of that, if you don't mind. Um, I met Bart, I believe, um, in 2004 at a poetry workshop in the Winchester Public Library, Winchester, Massachusetts. Um, and Bart was actually there with his father, um, who was one of the participants. And Bart, at that point, was moving away from um, Winchester, I believe, um, that there were some people within the group who um, asked if we could continue as a group. So we did continue as a group. And um, Bill, Bart's father, was one of the people who continued. Um, but I continued to see Bart when he would come back to Winchester, um, and we stayed in touch. Wonderful. Thank you. And I, I see that Chris has a question. So please unmute yourself, Chris, and, and ask. So I really liked Song for My Bean. That seems uh, very cute and charming. But I have to ask, uh, were you growing beans as, as a, a trappist? Or is this a, a gardening thing post? Or it's just unrelated? Oh, all right. Well, at, at the risk of embarrassing my bride, uh -oh. Janine's nickname is the bean. Ah, and uh, and so um, that's the best embarrassment. Yes, because it's a it's a nickname she got as a as a kid because she was very tall and very thin, and so everyone said you you look like a string bean, mm -hmm. and so that's a uh, and that's that's sort of a silly uh, a silly reimagining of of all things uh, that the William. Uh, Butler Yeats' poem uh, about the Lake Isle of Innisfree. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. So um, I see Jeff has his hand raised, but before Jeff asks the question, I know there may be some people who have, are physically raising their hand in their square, and we don't want to overlook you. Um, so after Jeff goes on, if you can't, if you don't know how to hit the raise hand icon in the reaction bar below, I'll scan to see if I can find somebody with their hand raised. So Jeffrey, please. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, he's, he's, he's dropped his question in the chat. Uh, page 123, Bart, of your book says that this is the first of two volumes. May we expect another group of poems? Yeah, I'm uh, three quarters of the way through volume two, which is really so um, as a as a poet, I was taught poetry at Ambrose Elementary School, and I'm I'm blessed to have uh, one of my elementary school teachers here, um, uh, Maura Albert, but okay. uh, I was, you know, uh, I was part of a little workshop on haiku. And after that, I kept writing haiku and have only deepened sort of an engagement with Asian poetic form, you know, in part through my, uh, my studies at Bowdoin, where, uh, you know, I, um, I, I had a long, I uh, learned, I actually, one of my, my, my thesis advisor, Kidder is here from uh, from dear old Wabnoid, and uh, you know so I uh, learned a, a fair amount about of Japanese and Chinese poetry doing an East Asian history degree, and um, so the second version of poems is haiku and tonka, and it's about three quarters done. I it's short. If I want to go to press with at least a hundred pages of poetry, so I've got about twenty-five uh, pages of uh, I'm writing now of Hai Bun. So maybe next year, maybe the new, the year after. But as the uh, the Ernest and Julio Gallo brothers say, we will serve no wine before it's time, but hopefully soon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, we look forward to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I see next in the queue is uh, is John Buck. So please unmute yourself. Hey, Bart. Wonderful to 
to hear you reading those. Um, I have to say one of the things I loved about them reading them before is I heard your voice in them, even just reading them on my own, if they, your voice really comes through in them. Um, but one of the things that, particularly as I was reading the last section, I felt there were times that I sort of E.E. Uh, e. Cummings-esque adjectives sneaking in, compound adjectives. And was that something you're thoughtful of or am I just seeing it everywhere because I love Cummings so much? But I think there's one was, I don't have it in front of me right now, but one was like blue bright as a compound adjective, but there was another one like that that I, I felt like I was sort of wandering through the backwoods of Harvard Square again past Cummings' house. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, but the funny thing is that is more from Yosa Boussong than, than a, if I'm imitating anyone, I'm, e I'm imitating some Japan Japanese haiku poets, but it totally works with Cummings too. Like, dude, now you're going to make me go back and reread Cummings, which is never a bad thing. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, interesting point, the, the John, that you brought up there. So we should all go back and read and read more E.E. E. Cummings. Uh, Bruce, please. So Bart, you have a very eclectic background from your time as a novice to your time as a musician to the intelligence and cybersecurity work you're doing now. And even as you just mentioned, you know, the work that you've done with Japanese and Chinese poetry forms. So I wanted to ask, um, how has you know your experience with the Tai Chi and Qigong that we do you know, influenced your work in any way in that aspect of spirituality and kind of meditation? Oh, that's it. Yeah, Bruce is a fellow uh, is a fellow student of uh, Tai Chi and Qigong, uh, which uh, and and I I will we will see him on Saturday as we go through the paces. But yeah, you know, Bruce, I think for me, the big thing there is thinking as much in terms of breath rhythm as in heartbeat rhythm when you're writing a line. I think it's the motion towards, and it's the motion towards like, and you'll know this as another bass player, you know, some lines almost have a natural rest at the end of them. And when you're reading aloud, you know, if you were to score it, there'd be a melody and then there'd be like a couple of measures of silence. And when you're reading aloud, you put that silence into it. So I think, um, I think it's breath time in addition to heartbeat time when you think metrically as a poet. Okay. And, yeah. Nice, um, but but thanks for bringing all of Bart's varied backgrounds into the Zoom because it's interesting to consider how they might influence his work. Um, so Rosemary, I see you have your hand up, please. Yes, well, I am one of the lucky participants <laughs> that was in Bart's group uh, in the library and which was also led by Maura. And I might add that it was such a, it was supposed to as last a month and mm -hmm. several members in the group enjoyed it so much that we asked Mara to lead a workshop, which lasted for 10 years. <laughs> so that was very good. And uh, I enjoyed, but I have one question for Bart because I don't think that too much happens by accident. And so I was surprised that you're, pages were not numbered. Oh. I mean, that, oh. was, an, that was an accident? Oh, in the, in the table yeah. of contents? Yes. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's an oversight by a novice, uh, uh, a novice author who uh, uh, is learning the process of uh, getting a work through the publication process. So it, you know, um, you're, you're very, you're, you're very kind to say that nothing happened, that this didn't happen by accident, but I assure you it did. <laughs> well, if I totally enjoyed it. And I also would just love to say that your poem about Billie Holiday is the best reaction to jazz I've ever heard. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> oh, that's high praise. That's high praise. And I love jazz. Yeah. My, my colleague who sits, uh, used to sit next to me is another huge jazz head. And he loaned me like a box set of 12 Billie Holiday per, uh, CDs. Oh. And, you know, uh, I wrote that poem, you know, sort of as a, as a response to those recordings. And, uh, you know. It's beautiful. It was yeah. beautiful. Wonderful praise, wonderful praise, Rosemary. Thank you, thank you. And, and thanks for mentioning Maura's teaching for uh, this workshop for 10 years, Maura. Say a word or two about that, if you would. Um, where to begin? Um, it was, the group um, was a wonderful group and it was the group that kept itself alive um, with their care for each other, with their attention to each other. Um, with the way they helped support one another. Um, so it was my privilege just to be there really with them. You were wonderful, Mara. Oh yeah, like, like Mara is the car mechanic of, of lines. Like if, is your line slow? Does your not line not flow? Are the beats off? Are the incidences and consonances not quite cutting it? Well, Maura Linehan has a fix for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, care, attention, and support, which you know, more brought into the room, is is a great blueprint for for life. So, um, thank you for that, and and thank you both, Maura and Bart, for sharing your work this evening with us. It's been a really wonderful Kanio's poetry event. Um, I have dropped into the chat how those who've joined us, if they want to show their love to are not non-for-profits, you can do that. Uh, and also support us on bookshop.org, which is a wonderful competitor to Amazon. Uh, don't uh, stay away from the uh, scar that scarlet letter. If you wanna buy books online, bookshop.org is the place to go. And we appreciate your support. But why don't we all unmute ourselves now and give a really rousing applause and thank you to the two wonderful poets we had tonight, Bart and Maura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay! Thank you so Bravo. much. Bravo. Bravo. Wonderful. For, for those of you who live on Long Island, yes, who are poetry fans, get the Tacanio's books. There are very few poetry bookstores in the entire country that are as good. Probably Moe's you know, in, uh, in Berkeley, you know, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, obviously the Grolier, but like, it's astounding. Go check it out. Thank you, Bart. Yeah. And everybody read poetry. You <laughs> if you don't, if you, and, and if you don't write it, read it, your life will be improved by the act. And please read Maura and Bart's. And if you don't have their work, we can help you with that as well. So ha have a good night, everybody. And join us at our next poetry event, uh, if you can, on the 24th of February, in person, of course, uh, Emma Walton Hamilton. So uh, once again, Mary and I both thank uh, Maura and Bart for being with us tonight. And the audience for sharing in the experience of making the world a better place by listening to poetry. Thank you. Have Thank, you. Thank you all. Good night. Take care. Thank Good night, Martin. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Catherine. Thank you guys.